He can empathize with us because he was in all ways tempted just like you and me, yet without sin. So while we study God's story about the New Testament and we stay in the Gospels for now, we're just following the life of Jesus, right? Right. I mean, we know that he was born. So next we study the ministry of Jesus and of course his death and resurrection. That will conclude this segment. Well, we're off to a good start with the, with the past review, and, and I know now where we're heading, so why don't we go ahead and get started? That's fine with me. Oh, by the way, Jason, remember when we were there in the Sea of Galilee on the boat, and Amir, our, our tour guide, was telling us something very, very important. He even had us hold out our arms. Oh, that's right. Well, you watch for that. That's coming up. I will. It's easy to remember God's story about Jesus because you, it's the normal progression. Think of it. Birth, ministry, death, and resurrection. Very simple to remember. So I didn't give you some kind of an acronym for that. If you can think of your own life, you're going to be born, you're going to be doing something ministry-wise, working, whatever it might be, and you're going to die and you're going to be raised. So, it's a very natural progression. Jesus, born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. His ministry, some say it started in 26 A.D., A.D. 26. Others say, no, it started A.D. 29. That's why I'm giving you both of those dates. His death, 30 or 33 A.D. And, of course, his resurrection would be the same thing. Now... All you have to do is fill in the details. But now when you think of trying to share with someone the, the process of the New Testament, you start with Jesus, his story about Jesus. What's his story about Jesus? Well, Jesus was born, Jesus ministered, Jesus died, and Jesus rose again from the, from the dead. So you can at least get started there. Now, that's not rocket science, right? I'm adding two other things, baptism and temptation, because they're very important events that take place in the life of our Lord. And they actually lead to his ministry. All right, let's start looking at this. The books, what books cover this period of time? Well, we looked at it before, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you will find the life of Christ primarily historically in those four books. Now, when you get to the epistles, the epistles explain what you read about in the four Gospels. Just as the New Testament explains the Old Testament, the epistles explain the four Gospels. Because the four Gospels basically give you sort of a, a video account of the Lord's life. And it's like watching video as you read through these Gospels and you see he was here, he went up there, he goes down here, he does this, he performs this miracle, he teaches this lesson. Well, what's that all about? You get into the epistles and the epistles say, this is what that means. This is what Jesus was communicating. We're going to look at his ministry. That's what we're going to focus on. There's not much to focus on on his birth other than the fact that he was born of a virgin. There's not a whole lot that we have to explain about his death and resurrection because you've heard that many times, you've read that many times. But let's focus on his ministry. First of all, there is a preparation time. Jesus didn't just all of a sudden appear on the scene and start doing all kinds of things. There was a time of preparation. And the preparation was primarily there in Judea. That's the southern part of Israel. This was a time of obscurity probably about eight months. People didn't look and say, oh, there's the Messiah, or there's the Son of God, or, or there's the King of the Jews. He was in obscurity during that period of time. Then, let's just look at his baptism. I said, that starts his ministry. Jesus is identifying with mankind. He is baptized by John the Baptist. And then he comes up out of the water, and Luke chapter 4 tells us, that he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And it goes into this time of temptation in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And as you read the temptation scene there, the devil says, look, 
if you're the son of man or son of God. You haven't eaten for 40 days. You have the power of turning these, these stones into bread. So why don't you turn these stones into bread and show that you are really the son of God. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. But by every word that proceeds from my father. Now, that was a real temptation. If you haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, and someone says, look, you have the ability, turn it into bread. Go ahead and satisfy that hunger that you have, that desire that you have. And the devil uses the same approach to us, doesn't he? Yep. Hey, you deserve it. Hey, you've worked hard for it. You should have it. And we think, oh, I did work hard for that. Yeah, I got the money to do it. Yeah, I can do that. A lot of times, the devil will come to us and say, you can have this. All you have to do is just twist the truth a little bit. Just bend the rules a little bit. Another temptation takes him up to this high pinnacle. And he shows him all of these kingdoms. And the devil's basically saying, look, you don't have to go to the cross for this to be yours. You want to be the king of the world? I have the authority to make you king of the world. And everybody will bow down. Later on, he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, hey, jump off. And he quotes from scripture. Recognize the devil knows the Bible. So he quotes from scripture. And the Bible says that you could do that and, 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 and God will send his angels so that you don't even trip over anything. Jesus says, it also says, do not tempt the Lord your God. So these are very real temptations. And that's why later on in the New Testament we read that he, was, he can empathize with us because he was in all ways tempted just like you and me, yet without sin. His early disciples, you go to the Gospel of John and you see that he calls Andrew, calls Peter, Nathaniel's another one. He started to call some of his disciples. He doesn't appoint them yet as apostles. Nicodemus. This is where he has this encounter, John chapter 3, with Nicodemus. Then he begins his ministry up there in Galilee. In fact, one time as we were out on the Sea of Galilee, we were out on the lake there. Sometimes it's called Lake Gennesaret. We call it the Sea of Galilee. And our tour guide said, all right, over there's Mount Arbel. Put your left arm facing Mount Arbel. And over here is Bethsaida, so put your other arm towards Bethsaida. He said, what I want you to know is everything in between the palms of your two hands is where Jesus spent three years to minister. Wow. Now that is hard to believe. No, not all over the world, right here. This is where he spent three years. Why? To fulfill what is written by the, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2. And when you get to the gospel of Matthew chapter 4, and it says to fulfill what was written by Isaiah the prophet about going to Zebulun and Naphtali, the land of the, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the land along the Jordan, a great light has shone. And those living in darkness have seen this great light. That's why he chose that area. Galilee. This is where he became very popular. Why? Because he is performing these miracles. Right there in Capernaum where he stayed those three years. He was performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Same thing up in Chorazin, not far from Capernaum. Then over there in Bethsaida. And that's why these three cities saw more light, had more spiritual truth given to them than all the cities in the world. And because they rejected that light, they rejected that truth, Jesus cursed all three cities. You go there today, you see nothing but ruins. Before the 12, you read what all he did up in Galilee after he chose the 12. And then he goes, withdraws. He goes up into northern Galilee. That's where he is up there in Caesarea Philippi. And he asks the disciples the questions. The question, who do men say that I am? 
It's not that he had a senior moment. <laughs> I mean, I might ask you one of these days, what, what's my name again? Who am I? Now, who do men say that I am? Eventually, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Sermon on the Mount. Been there many times. Jesus is standing there. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Beatitudes. Then also, feeding the 5,000. All in that same general area. All that was going on up there in Galilee. Then in Perea. Perea is that area. It's now Jordan, but it's that area east of the Jordan River. And he spent time there. He actually spent three months in that area. This was the time when he was being rejected. He was on his way down to Jerusalem. And he knew what was going to happen in Jerusalem. But he ministers there in Perea. One of the things he does, he sends out the 70. This is where he talks about the Good Samaritan. This is where he ends up going up to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. And then he goes back to Perea. Here's where you read about the 10 lepers that are healed. And only one comes back to give Jesus thanks. Zacchaeus up there in the tree. And Jesus says, today I must eat with you. And later on he says, salvation has come to this house. That's Perea. And of course, eventually we come into Passion Week. And that's where you have the crucifixion and the resurrection. So that is a very quick view, overview from Google Earth of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that really was a great illustration that our tour guide showed us. You know, it's really amazing when you think of how far and how fast the gospel spread in such a short period of time. Uh, God's story for the New Testament isn't complete yet, so what do you have for us next? Well, speaking of spreading the gospel, we get right into it by seeing how God reveals his story through the church. Hmm. Now, I know that's really when the gospel started to spread geographically. Um, and knowing you, I bet you do have a map or two to share with us, don't you? <laughs> you know me too well. I'll let you watch the next segment before I map out the rest of the story. <laughs> 